Hi everyone, I'm Rosemarie Miller here with Tara Watson, the Director of Center for Economic Security and Opportunity at Brookings, here to tell us about the generosity of each state's safety net programs. Thank you so much for joining me today, Tara. My pleasure. So Tara, can you explain how state and federal program policies interact to determine eligibility and benefit levels in the context of safety net programs for single parent families? Sure. In this country, we don't just have one big safety net program. We have a complex network, patchwork, if you will, of overlapping programs. Some of them are funded by the federal government. Some of them are funded by states and some of them are a combination of the, tr the two. And there are also programs at the local level. And these programs are all serving somewhat overlapping populations and have somewhat different purposes. They pull pull together this uh, sort of stew of supports for low income people in the country. So mm -hmm. we have um, a few programs that we think of as the most important programs in the safety net for single parent families. These include the earned income tax credit, which is a uh, federal credit for workers with low incomes uh, that is primarily geared at workers with children. We also have a state level version of that same program uh, in many states. There's also the temporary assistance for needy families program, which is a traditional cash welfare program um, that came out of welfare reform and still provides some cash assistance, but has been declining over time. In addition, there are food assistance programs that are very important to families. So your article mentioned that safety net expenditures can conflate need and program design. How does the study address this issue and what methods are used to isolate the generosity of safety net program rules? Thanks for the question. This is an important distinction because if we just look at how much gets spent on a given program, we don't know for sure whether that's because uh, there's a lot of poverty in an area or at a given time or because uh, the program rules are designed to be generous. So in the study that we released uh, yesterday, what we tried to do is really narrow in on what the program rules say. So when a, the same person goes to get benefits in a given state in a given year, what are they likely to walk away with compared to that same person if they're in a different state or at a different time period? So to do this, we really uh, had to dissect the rules for all 50 states and DC and uh, determine if we look at someone with a given level of earnings, the given family structure, what could they get for each of the programs that we looked at, sum that all together, and that's our generosity index. And there are some variations based on the states, right? How, how are yes. these variations calculated? Like why, why are there variations? Yeah, so there's a mix of uh, federal and state program rules that actually affect the state level differences in generosity. So for example, the um, earned income tax credit program that I mentioned before, this is uh, there's a federal version of the program which applies equally across all states, but many states have added on to that state, uh, to that federal program with a state um, sort of top up um, that's usually operationalized as a percentage of the federal credit. And so as states enter the fray of, of providing the state EITC, they become um, differentially generous to uh, their low income workers. Similarly, the TANF program, part of what happened with welfare reform is it went from being an entitlement that was organized at the national level to a, a program that had a lot of state discretion, has a lot of state discretion how money is spent. In fact, much of the TANF spending doesn't even go to cash assistance at all anymore. But even the part that does, the states have a lot of flexibility in the benefit levels, who is eligible, um, and that leads to a lot of differences across states in how much a family is likely to get in those benefits. Do you think political affiliations that states have, does that affect the variations we see? Uh, yes, there is a correlation there in that red states tend to have lower TANF programs. The state EITC programs are less um, clear cut in terms of their political affiliation because those programs both support low income families, but they also are thought to promote work. 
And so uh, that can be appealing to both sides of the political aisle. Mm -hmm. And how did COVID affect the generosity index? So if you uh, were to go to our website and look at our, our graphs that we have up there, you will see uh, just a real aberration that happened during the COVID period. The safety net became much more generous for a short while. So most notably, this came from the expansion of the child tax credit and also some expansions in the SNAP program, which is the food assistance program that we looked at. Um, there were, of course, also many other supports coming out of the federal government, which aren't even captured in our safety net index, but even just focused on these programs that are the standard big picture safety net programs, we see huge changes um, from say 2019 to 2021. Most of that has disappeared by now. So the child tax credit has um, gone back to its 2019 levels roughly, and the SNAP benefit um, has retreated a fair amount as well. Um, there are still some states that have, um, as of 2022, which is the last year we looked at, still had some um, extra generous SNAP benefits, but those have now phased out um, with the end of the pandemic boost that they had. So. Um, this was a short-term boost that actually made a big difference to families um, that has largely gone away. There will still be probably a slightly more generous safety net overall than there was prior to the pandemic. And Tara, I, I just kind of want your personal opinion on this. Is the tax system an appropriate venue for addressing social issues? That's a great question. There's a big tension in the policy space about whether it's better to do this type of redistributive policy through the tax system or to do it um, through more of a traditional transfer system. One nice thing about doing it through the tax system is that um, it tends to be more accessible. So there are a lot of burdens with going to a, a welfare office or a series of welfare offices for different pro transfer programs. and to the extent that most people file taxes and there are systems in place to help people file taxes, um, it can be easier for people to get benefits when they're operationalized through the tax code. So I do see that as an advantage. However, one limitation is that many of the programs that we do have through the tax code are restricted to people who work. And so for families where the parents are unable to find work, um, they're really left out in the cold. And as we've moved more to this tax supported safety net, um, I worry that the people with the most disadvantage are going to get left behind. And finally, Tara, is there anything on your radar regarding safety net programs that you believe should be on ours? Well, the 2021 expansion of the CTC was a huge policy experiment. So not only did the child tax credit uh, expand in in um, generosity, but it was for the first time made available to those non-workers that I just talked about. And so um, we saw in doing that, that we reduced child poverty almost in half um, for that one year period where it was in place. And now the child poverty rate has gone back up roughly to where it was before the pandemic. And so um, we saw through that experiment that these policies really do make a difference to families and to children. And so I hope we can take some of that momentum and use it to think about what we should be doing going forward for the safety net policy in this country. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you.